Good morning and welcome to WRCO's WRCE's morning show. This morning is our uh, monthly visit with Senator Howard Markline and today we have Assembly Representative Todd Novak with us. And um, Senator Markline, it's been a month since you've been here and a lot has been going going on and as far as the state budget and other things, hasn't it? It sure has. Um, you know, when I was here last, um, we hadn't passed the uh, shared revenue bill. Uh, that was passed like two weeks, I think, before the the uh, budget was passed, and uh, and then also, of course, the the state budget, you know, was, was passed out of my committee and and uh, joint finance committee, and then uh, went to the legislature and, and passed, and and has been uh, signed into law. So, yeah, um, a lot of stuffs happened, you know, and in uh, the, the the shared revenue bill is. Um, I know it's gotten a lot of um, media attention. Um, the, I mean, the impact on every one of our cities, counties, villages, townships is, is significant. And, uh, you know, I'm just uh, happy, you know, I've, I've got the, all the numbers here. I can cite every one of uh, every community in my district and the increase that they're going to get. And it's it's huge. That was a big ask from um, county administrators and township, everyone, wasn't it? Oh, sure. And, and and I got to give a lot of credit to Representative Tony Kurtz. I mean, I think it was back in September last year is when uh, Representative Kurtz uh, and uh, State Senator uh, Mary Felskowski started uh, w- working on this whole thing. And it it took them almost a year to, to you know, because it's, you know, it started out shared revenue um, has been frozen basically for for decades now. And you know, it, they need, you know, it needed to go up. And so they started working on this, um, like I said, last September or so. And then, um, and then about in January, I believe is when the, this whole issue, and it doesn't really affect us out here at all, but the, the Milwaukee County and the Milwaukee city pension problem kind of surfaced. And, and basically city of Milwaukee, especially they're, uh, they're heading for ba- they were heading for bankruptcy, you know, if they didn't deal with their pension problem. So uh, that kind of got tucked in into that bill as well. And there was all kinds of meetings. I was involved with a whole bunch of those meetings with the city of Milwaukee and Milwaukee County. And um, anyway, so and it's important, you know, I don't know that any one of us, I don't think it's a good good for our any city in our state to go bankrupt especially your biggest city, you know, it's just not, it's not, it's just not good, uh, a good image to have. So um, anyway, so we got that, that resolved as well. And last week, the Milwaukee Common Council voted to approve the 2% inc- increase in their sales tax. So it doesn't affect us out here. <clears throat> um, if, if, uh, if Phil Nee goes to a, a Brewers game, then he may have to pay the extra 2% uh, in, in sales tax uh, to the city or to the yeah, city of Milwaukee. But, you know, for, anybody out here it doesn't affect us at all now you know how does that work that cities can raise their do they have to get permission from the state to raise their city sales tax yes they do so and is there increments that they can they're allowed to do it or well we have a few communities in the state that are it's called the the premier resort area tax the Pratt uh, the Wisconsin Dells is the classic case because when you look at a city like Wisconsin Dells it's probably got a population of 2,800 people you know residents that live there well I don't know what the population of Wisconsin Dells is on a weekend but in the summertime but it's it's huge so they're permitted to increase. And they have increased their their sales tax because they've got to support um, fire, police, all kinds of services that go far beyond a community of 2,800 people. So um, <clears throat> we do have a, a number of those communities around the state that uh, be, with legislation from the, the, the state uh, permits them to have the premier uh, resort area tax. And that's basically seen sales only so that the tourists help pay for the necessary first responders and all of those things. Exactly. Exactly. So, and I don't know what the, uh, the Dells, um, their rate is now, but it's, you know, it's probably, you know, 
an additional six, seven percent. And, you know, when you, you know, when we travel, if you travel, you know, go to Chicago, for example, if you ever stay or have a, a meal in Chicago or, you know, I mean, their, their taxes down there are incredible. You know, it's and, and nobody you don't blink an eye, you know, it's just part of the, the cost. And I think for many of the visitors <clears throat> to the Dells, I think it's probably the same thing. I think, you know, when they rent their room and it's 150 bucks a night, they don't blink that it's going to be an extra 10 percent or whatever on top of that um for for local taxes well i, I think the last time i did eat in illinois it was like 10 percent sales tax and i'm sure when people come from out of state they don't blink an eye about paying a higher sales tax yeah yeah so anyway so the milwaukee going back to milwaukee uh, again the city um tax and that was approved last week so that's um you know, going to happen um, probably on January 1st is when that rate goes into effect. Um, and it takes um, uh, it takes several months for the Department of Revenue to um, make the necessary adjustments, uh, which will happen this fall, and uh, in order for it to, to go into effect on, on January 1st. And I think the county, um, the Milwaukee County Board will be voting uh, sometime here probably in the next month. And uh, and that would be a countywide sales tax increase of 0.4 percent. And then will they see that the results of that in with the first quarter? Um, yeah, the um, and I'm not sure when when the settlement, um, how often the the city in, in the Milwaukee their settlement is with the, um, but yeah, it, it's going to be you know and and the. Um, they, they wanted to get this thing done too for a number of reasons. Number one is, uh, and I've talked to the the police um, union and the um, firefighters union, and um, you know they, they're facing um, huge layoffs if they don't. If the city the city was looking at hundreds and hundreds of, of police officers getting fired, uh, the police union was they're looking at closing a number of fire stations if this thing um, hadn't passed. So the 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 bulk of this money, the huge majority of this money is going to go to to fix their pension problem in both the city and the county. And again, they the problem is is they have their own pension system. They don't participate in the Wisconsin retirement system like every teacher or county, any other government um, employee in the state of Wisconsin. They have their own and they've had it for years. And the Milwaukee city and uh, county pension system covering their police and fire, uh, I describe it as very poorly designed and very poorly funded. Okay. And when you combine those two, it's not a, a good, whereas the state retirement system is wonderfully designed, a very, very well designed system. And, and we funded it and uh, which is unlike what's happened in Milwaukee. Is there a chance ever that the state could say, you know, you need to move to the state pension plan? That's part of the deal is that all new hires, we call it a soft close, all new hires uh, so if you're a new um, firefighter coming in or a new um, police officer getting hired in Milwaukee, you will automatically now be enrolled in the state retirement system. OK. And so, you know, over time, uh, this old retirement, this legacy um, Milwaukee city, Milwaukee County uh, retirement uh, system is going to go away and all employees it will be in the same um, uh, program that again every teacher and county employee is uh, enrolled in uh, out for the rest of the state now we've been talking about milwaukee but there was some good results locally for the new with the new budget wasn't there oh yeah i mean i think you know and i um you know again after the dust settled uh, you know with the uh, governor signing the budget and all that i was able to kind of go back and kind of reflect on some of the things that, you know, that that are in the budget, you know, and, you know, when I think of health care, for example, you know, the, the, we increased funding for our hospitals um, significantly. And I've got nine hospitals, nine community hospitals from, you know, Boscobel, Richmond Center, Hillsborough, 
um, Dodgeville, you know, we've got, I, you know, Todd and I were at a groundbreaking and um, yes, or it was two days ago in, in Darlington for their new hospital. So, uh, so funding for our hospitals is going to go up. Nursing homes, another area that, um, and they've been hurting through this COVID, you know, issue, you know, in the last few years. And uh, we uh, increased the funding for our, our nursing homes by $195 million. So, I know I've heard from local um, hospital administrators, hospital, um, nursing home administrators, uh, how happy they are with the additional funding that that they're going to get. Transportation, um, I I believe it was just an outstanding transportation budget, um, especially for local roads. Uh, We included, um, there's a, a part of the local road budget is a a new program um and i got to give uh represent travis channel a lot of credit on this it's we call it the arep the agricultural road improvement program 150 million dollars one-time money dedicated to the town roads that uh they, they're not they don't qualify for any federal funding you know those are these Town roads that we live on, that milk trucks have to travel on, you know, feed deliveries and all that, they, that they get posted in the spring. And so, you know, they're weight restricted. So uh, the $150 million is going to go for those small local class B um, highways that we've, you know, we've got all kinds of them out, out here. But uh, that's that's great. Um, and then, you know, we kept all the funding, all the uh, projects on schedule. Uh, for for this uh, biennium, so um, no, it was an excellent transportation budget. Um, now, having said that, <laughs> the downside is that um, the governor uh, we we provided an increase in in GTA general transportation aids f- across the board for cities, counties, villages, and our townships. For some reason, um, the the governor vetoed the GTA increase for our townships. And so that was $10 million that, that he vetoed. And I know that our, our towns, uh, the, the town officials I've talked to are, they're not very happy, you know, that they were singled out for some reason uh, for not getting um, their increase in their GTA. So, you know, I mean, we've, you know, when I look at the, is the glass half empty or half full? The half full part says overall, it was a pretty darn good transportation budget. I don't know why we would have targeted those uh, townships for a, for why he would have you know targeted them for for a cut. But um, the income tax cut, you know, I was very supportive of that. Um, and um, you know, we we've got a we we had a, a surplus um, coming into the budget, and uh, we provided a significant um, income tax cut um, across the board, every every um, bracket. And uh, the governor vetoed the the top two rate cuts. So that means that anybody um, which cut the, uh, the, the, the tax cut, anybody making over $36,000 a year. So, which is the vast majority of the people in my district and vast majority of the people around the state. So that was disappointing. I, I thought he was going to veto the, the top bracket, but that, that third bracket, I was, I was kind of surprised that he, he vetoed that. So that was, that was uh, disappointing, but um, no. All in all, um, here in in Richland County, um, you know, the uh, we were able to get um, over four million dollars to complete uh, f- uh, County O. Um, that's been on the drawing board here for a long, long, long time. And you know, and I, I'm trying to think back of how many different highway commissioners um, we worked with on that, but. Uh, uh, Josh Elder w- was persistent. I got to give Josh a lot of credit, and and um, we were able to provide funding in the budget for um, for for that. So uh, I'm happy that that's you know finally that project's finally going to get done. Yeah, yeah. He actually sent a, a press release last week, and it's hard to believe that that project, excuse me, has been on the board since 2004. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it precedes me, and and again, uh, and and the and part of the challenge there is so much of the upfront design work, the you know planning, engineering, uh, that's a sunk cost they, the, that the county had um, had funded you know a long time ago. So 
you know, if um, if we hadn't gotten this um, money for County O, um, it would have been, well, un- unfortunate not getting a project done, but there would have been a lot of these costs that would have been for nothing uh, that were incurred in the past. Well, and it's kind of interesting, though, they were able to come up with funding in other areas to at least get parts of it done at different times. This, though, will complete the project. Yep. And uh, again, the you know the, the 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 cheapest two segments, phase one and phase three, were the, were the smallest dollar amounts, and and those did get funded and completed. And it was the this larger um, phase two that uh, was sitting out there and, and needed to get done. So you have some other good news though for Richland County residents too, don't you? As far as the shared revenue, yeah. Oh gosh, you know, again, shared revenue, and it's not just Richland County; it's every one of my um, communities, every one of uh, of my counties. And you know, um, when I, when I look, you know, well, at Richland County, for example, um, and shared revenue is the money that comes from the state back to our uh, villages, cities, um, townships, and, and the county. And when I look at Richland County collectively, all of the um, municipalities here and the county, um, you know, the shared revenue is going to go up by almost $2 million, okay, per year. Uh, That's a 53% increase in the shared revenue for for the the whole county, okay? Um, And, uh, you know, city uh, of Richland Center, that's going up almost $300,000. Uh, Richland County um, portion of that is going up by eight hundred thousand dollars, over eight hundred thousand. So, again, these are significant, you know, increases. Um, again, everyone, uh, town of Richland uh, is going up one hundred and thirty-two percent. Village of Lone Rock's going up, you know, forty-four thousand dollars. So, and, and this is all money that they can use to to, to fund, you know, local services, EMS. Um, police and, and fire. So, um, yeah, I'm just happy that we got that done. Um, the other good part about this is that this is now tied to the sales tax collections for the state. Okay. And so this, the numbers that I just cited are not fixed. They're going to go up or down, probably up with the, um, the sales tax collections in the state. So if sales tax collections go up 4%, kind of tied to inflation, then the revenue uh, to our local um, communities will go up by 4% in the future. So they got some some cushion built in there, some inflationary um, um, cushion built into the into this program. Now, the shared revenue hadn't really kept up with inflation, had it for years. No. This is the first time it's gone up in a long time. And I think decades, probably. Yeah. Now, um, Todd Novak's with us today, and... Todd, you are the mayor of Dodgeville, right? So this really, as a state representative, you see it one way, but you also see it another way as a mayor. Yeah, and um, I can't remember what we got for an increase. Um, We're on the lower end of shared revenue anyway, just because of the valuation of our our city. But, um, you know, this has been a long journey, as Howard alluded to. And we first originally started talking in the assembly, at least, about increasing shared revenue last summer we had a meeting and i I thank tony kurt so much um for leading this charge and then the shared revenue build was held in my committee i was chair of local government and i think it's the longest hearing i ever had it was about seven hours it was really fun i um did not think we'd ever get this through our times and i'm like we're never going to get this done. And it, sim- it wasn't the shared revenue. I think everybody in unison was in agreement that we needed to increase uh, shared revenue to the municipalities. However, the Milwaukee piece kind of messed. Sticking the Milwaukee piece in there really kind of clogged it up a little bit. And um, But overall, it is fantastic. I'm hearing from communities all over um, my district, as Howard is with his, that are very excited. This has been frozen Oh, I can't even remember how many years. But what I really like, too, is that it's now it's set. We don't have to worry every two years we do a budget how much we're going to increase in shared revenue. Tying it to the sales tax, it's 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 fantastic because it'll automatically increase with sales tax increases and everything. I was just... Uh, Howard and I were at the Lafayette County Fair this weekend, and I ran into a village president uh, from a municipality in Lafayette County. And they went to referendum last November to keep their uh, EMS because they were running, struggling, funding it. And it failed. 
and he came up to me at the fair and he said, thank you guys so much. He goes, because of the extra increase in shared revenue we're getting, we're going to be able to keep things moving. And I'm hearing that all over. So, and, um, overall, you know, it, it um, um, it was it was a good budget, as Howard said. A little problem. I have some issues with the vetoes, um, but we 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 put a lot of funding. I have been around long enough, not as long as Howard, but uh, around long enough where um, I've had budgets to deal with that had no money. And you're sitting there. What can we do here to this one with the surplus? But sometimes the sur- I'm not quite sure when you have that much money. I would say. And Howard probably knows this. You know, we had a seven, around seven billion dollars surplus. Probably had fifty billion dollars in requests to spend it. So it um, um, wasn't the easiest to figure out. But overall, I, I'm very happy with this budget. Um, and uh, the roads projects in there. Oh, as Howard said, we've also in the lower portion of Howard Senate District and my district, there's projects going right now that Howard and I put in the budget what, two, three years ago, Highway 39, um, the Lone Rock Bridge um, that we had moved up that are now being funded and moving along. And so it's really, I know people get upset about road construction during the time, but it's really nice to see. If you drive around, you're not, you very seldom will you not run into some road construction. So um, overall, for a small community, you know, it, this is a plus. Yeah, it is a plus. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a local government guru, and I, I've been doing this so long, and that's always been the one number thing that I've heard about from municipalities since I've been in office is we need an increase in shared revenue. Um, and then um, also I believe the funding for schools is pretty good, um, even though I will hear that it's not enough because that's just the standard that you always hear. Um, we did some stuff there, and... Um, you know, how hospitals, nursing homes, as Howard said. And um, so, yeah, I would say that bar his vetoes that I'm still trying to figure out, we did it. We did a really good budget this year. And uh, the governor, to his credit, did negotiate the shared revenue school funding, which he, he kind of went back on. Um, so it was, you know, he was in the room for a lot of this. So, so I'm hearing, you know, a good... Um, a good budget, good shared revenue, but it still leaves money for a rainy day fund. I believe we have four billion now with his vetoes, and f- no, we we have. Um, after he the veto, uh, we just got a fiscal bear memo memo last week. We will ha- end the year, end the biennium with a surplus of four billion dollars plus uh, a rainy day fund of one point eight billion. All right. Well, I think on that note, we'll take a break and be back in just a few moments. Welcome back to the morning show on WRCO, WRCE. I'm Joanne Krulotz filling in for Phil Nee, who has a much needed vacation and we are here today with Senator Howard Markline and Assembly Representative Todd Novak. And we've been discussing, you know, shared revenue, the budget, and the good things about them and the bad things about them. But overall, it seems to be a pretty good consensus that overall it's good for counties and districts and the state as a whole. Um, maybe not so good for uh persons that you know individuals themselves as far as the tax bracket and the possibility of raised property taxes with the uh, governor's increase in property taxes for the next 400 years i know that kind of opens up a can of worms but when i first saw that i didn't you know i thought 400 years that's a long time did it did he just kind of change the number a little bit and you know I, it's clear what he did he just crossed out a couple of digits and a and a dash and um you know added it basically became a 400 year um tax increase so um maybe todd will be around then but uh but i know i know i won't be but um you know and it, it you know that was just um kind of disingenuous i think i don't you know i don't there, there is um 
no, nobody that, you know, um, both sides of the aisle or whatever that believes that, you know, a 400 year commitment or, uh, is, uh, is even appropriate. I mean, to, to make, you know, that kind of thing. I don't know. I was just, uh, I, I, you know, I was, and I, I don't know, you know, again, Todd mentioned this a little bit ago, you know, that there, there was negotiations on that. This is part of that shared, um, revenue agreement and stuff. And I'm, Pretty sure that the legislative leaders did not um, even talk about a, a 400 year uh, commitment to increase property taxes down the road. Now, though, this is tied to the biennial budget, which only goes to 2025. So in 2025, it can be changed, can't it? You can't um, bind a future legislator and governor unless it's a constitutional amendment. And, you know, on this veto here, the 400 year times frame i've had people say to me why did you guys write the budget so he could do that he can't i mean i that's my firm belief legally he can't and i'm sure somewhere along the line it'll be challenged but we can change it in, in two years i don't know if it was more of a political statement or what it was but you're, you're talking a huge huge property tax increase and i know uh, as i talk to people property taxes are a huge issue with them and um I'm just not sure what he was thinking. And again, I'll go back to the deal I said before. I mean, I know people may have a hard time believing this in the legislature, but we have split government and a handshake's a handshake. And that's kind of the rule when you come to a deal. And um, this is part of the education and shared revenue um, agreement we had with him. And for him to do this just kind of makes you wonder, you know, what's going to happen in the next six months? Will we be able to trust him? Because I know he wants to work on another tax cut, which he should have just left the one in there. But um, so I don't know if that's going to happen. There's different things he vetoed. He wants to now all of a sudden negotiate on. And, um, you know, how I can attest this. We went through this last time. We eliminated the personal property tax in the budget two years ago, and then he vetoed it and then came out with the same pretty much exact language he vetoed. And it, sometimes it just baffles you, but that's politics. And um, um, we'll, we'll see what happens with this. Um, even the school, I've had school superintendents who will not publicly tell, tell me this, but say that they just can't believe that he did this too. So I think it was just a political statement. Every government, a governor, even Governor Walker was here. They kind of put a little political statements in their budget when they present it, and you know, and we we get take it out and and veto process. So, but then you know, with like you said, as far as the um, tax, you know, he vetoed that for thirty six thousand up to four hundred thousand. That you know. All we're going to save is $36, but then he also added this property tax on, so it's basically a, a wash. We're not going to gain anything, right? Yeah, $36 tax cut, and Harkin knows his tax cut stuff uh, back uh, of his hand, but uh, um, I, I, I expected him to veto the top tax bracket. I fully expected it just by his language, but that middle one that affects it's probably 70% of the public just kind of really baffles me um and you know you're saving 36 dollars, and um I, i'm just i'm just still scratching my head at that one too i'm not sure why uh that i mean we've got the money it's the people's money and this is one thing i think the difference in our philosophy versus the governor's is we i firmly believe this is the people's money um it's not our money and um so i think that's the, the philosophical difference between the two of us do you think, like you have $4 billion, let's, let's put it at $4 because it was $7 billion. Um, do you run into some people who are happy that we still have that for future expenses that may crop up? Or do you, are the majority saying, that's our money and we want it back? You know, um, you know when you look at why we have... Um, had a surplus and have a surplus um, that was largely due to a, an incredible amount of federal money, one-time federal money coming into the state. That's the uh, the PPP loans businesses got. That's the uh, payments that individuals got. Money that went to um, counties, to um, hospitals, to airports. I mean, um, it's. I think it was. Um, 
somewhere in the area, $65 billion of one-time money dropped into the state of Wisconsin. And that filtered its way through the economy, okay? And it resulted in inflation, <laughs> shocking. Um, you know, wages were going up and, and all that. And it also resulted in, uh, with inflation, the, the prices of goods and services went up, okay? Which is why our sales tax went up 10%. We did not sell 10% more stuff, okay? The prices went up 7, 8, 9, 10% or more, you know, depending upon what you're, you're buying. So, um, so anyway, a lot of that surplus that we had going into this budget cycle was one-time money from taxes that people paid extra, okay, on stuff. And so, you know, and... Todd mentioned this earlier. We've got needs. You know, their inflation hit the state of Wisconsin too. It hit um, workers. Uh, our costs have gone up. We need to fund that stuff. But um, largely, that is taxpayer money. That I believe a significant part of that ought to be returned to the taxpayers. And this idea of letting it sit around. I mean, and I've had a couple people, you know, say, "Well, we ought to we ought to build a foundation and whatever." It's like, are you kidding me? To, to, to increase taxes, to have it sit someplace else. I'd rather have that money in people's pockets. You make better decisions about how to spend your money, I think, than, than government does. And it's, and I, th that's a general statement, but even like the federal level, you know, the further we get away from our local communities, you know, pe people make smart decisions with their money at kitchen tables, you know, and, and I trust that. And that's where I believe, you know, the, the bulk of that surplus ought to go is, is back to the taxpayers. I'm very comfortable looking ahead. And I, and I, I spent a lot of time when we did the budget about what's our structural um, situation going to be down the road. So, you know, two years from now, we're going to have to do another budget, you know. And I don't want to be in a situation where we're, we're, we're hurting. I was very comfortable with the budget that we passed that um, we would not have any issues going into the next, um, the next budget cycle. Are you comfortable with budgets at two-year frameworks, or should it be annual? Should it be a little longer? You know, if you do it every year, I mean, um, Todd, Todd's a mayor, and, and you, you know, when you do it every two years, or school districts especially, I think, you know, they, they need to plan more than 12 months out. I mean, their their year started on July, their fiscal year started on July 1st as well, so Gosh, you know, I think two years is is appropriate. I don't, I can't imagine going through this um, every year and having every school district, every tech college, every county, every city, you know, w waiting to see what happened with the budget to figure out what they're going to do. You know, they, um, and I've heard this from, especially from school district administrators, is they'd like even more certainty out into the future so they can plan um, staffing levels and that sort of thing out into the future. Now, you just said staffing levels, and we were kind of talking about, you know, businesses that are hurting because they can't get enough employees and they're raising their wages and everything. That was one good thing, too, that came out of this budget was that state workers will get an increase. Yes, and, you know, again, it's, a, it's an example of, how inflation is, has hit, you know, the state of Wisconsin. And, and I, um, I've got uh, the Basketball prison, you know, is in my, um, my district, as is the um, New Lisbon prison. A lot of state, you know, employees out here. And we were able to increase the um, compensation significantly for not just our correctional officers, but um, district attorneys, assistant district attorneys, public defenders and uh, and the state patrol uh, all they're all having problems with recruiting uh, and retention uh, of, uh, of staff so um, and again I think you know we're not that far from, uh, from where we sit here from from Baskerville and I think of the the officers down there and uh, so their minimum pay is going to go up starting pay up to $33 an hour plus there's going to be add-ons for um, for um, um, vacancy rate high vacancy rates and uh, so I, I you know I think that's going to make that wage competitive um, 
you know, there I've talked to so many people that, that work in in Baskerville or used to work at, in Baskerville, and you know, it's a tough situation. You've, it's a tough clientele uh, at the prison in, in Baskerville, and you know, you leave you leave for your shift, your eight hour shift. And you may not come home after eight hours. It might be you might get slammed and end up at, at 16 hours. And then you've got to come home, try to get a few hours of sleep before you, you go back again. And so uh, it's a it's a tough and you're working, you know, it's a 24 seven facility, you know. So while some people are off on the weekend or off, you know, uh, on a holiday, they're not. No, you know, not just the state, but small businesses and everything are having trouble staffing. What do you kind of see as the issue? Or I mean, because it's not just local, it's not just state, it's national. And I know some of us baby boomers, we're retiring and the birth rate they had said declined. But, you know, where are where is everybody that we're closing restaurants at three in the afternoon because we can't get enough help? And, and maybe raising wages is one aspect, but a lot of businesses I've talked to they've raised their wages and they still can't get the help no i don't i don't know it's a scra- head scratcher and it's an issue that i hear about all the time um from you know all employers and it's not you know 725 is the minimum wage there's nobody making 725 right now everybody's paying you know pretty good hourly wages um to get people i've run into you we were talking before about you know uh, in local governments I, I'm running into problems in Dodgeville hiring. I've got open spots, and that's never happened because it's not exactly, you know, th- th- these are good jobs. Um, and I, I, I can't figure it out. And then another thing that's happening, too, because I've been in these situations, and I'm hearing this a lot, is you'll interview somebody for a, a position, and you offer them the job at X amount of dollars. They go back to their employer, and they say, hey, I can go work for the city of Dodgeville for $28. They just offered me a job, and that employer immediately will match that. There's a lot of that going on, which is good. It's a competitive market. However, it's 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 an interesting environment. You know, I, I was talking to one of the quick trip managers, which used to be the – it is the gold standard of pay and profit sharing and uh, benefits. And there there are some quick trips that are looking for people too. And um, – and it's just, I'm, it's a head scratcher to me. So I, I just can't figure out where they are. And you're right. I'm I'm the only one in this room, not a baby boomer, by the way. But <laughs> oh, rub it in, rub it in. <laughs> the birth, uh, the birth rate has gone down. <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> and we should have saw this coming. Declining enrollment in schools started how many years ago? So I think what what we're what we're ha- is happening, and with COVID, we're feeling the effect of. That shrinkage of the workforce. Now, you brought up the fact that the minimum wage is seven twenty-five, and it's been that it seems like forever. Mm-hmm. Do you foresee the state ever changing that? Either of you? I I don't know. I mean, it's it's now. I mean, to me, I in my mind, the minimum wage is fifteen sixteen dollars an hour. Um, seriously, and um, you know, I mean, we could change it, but <clears throat> to what? Um, you know, as soon as we change it, then the next legislative session we're in they're going to be screaming you need to change it and i, I just don't know anybody that's making 725 um I, I really don't so yeah i heard somebody say that the average in wage in richland county is 15 something an hour so it's like double what the state minimum wage is but well what concerns me too is you're and, and <laughs> as somebody that is in a you know run a city so when you hire somebody at a higher rate to get them, then you've got people that have worked there 10 or 15 years that are the new person's making more than the old person, the person's been there. And and then you have to make it equitable. And this happens a lot, too, I'm, in businesses. That's what they have to do. So, you know, in order to get somebody, you got to pay more, but then you also have to look at your existing staff and increase them. And I know a lot of companies are trying to do that, too, and they want to keep these people. Yeah, I know, <clears throat> excuse me, almost 40 years ago, I kept telling my mom she needed to get a raise. And she go, oh, no, no. Well, then she gave my year's notice she was retiring. They couldn't find anybody to fill her position for what she was getting paid. So she finally got a raise her yeah. last year. You know, it, it was like... Well, and, and then people tend not to stay in jobs as long as they used to be. When I was growing up, it didn't look good on your resume to have six, seven jobs when you applied somewhere. 
And uh, nowadays, that's just common. I'm hearing that from larger companies. Your lands in, your Swiss colonies are higher uppers, not higher uppers, you know, mid managers. You know, they're sticking around a couple years and then they're moving on. And people are moving a lot too. Not so much in the lower, and I don't mean lower class, but manual labor jobs and stuff like that. But as, as far as, you know, mid manager jobs. Well, even education, you get yeah. teachers that move from, you know, for Pam Kent's to retire this year at 50 years that's unheard of uh Uh, for phil's been here 37 years i've been here 30 years you don't hear that anymore do you no i mean yeah i mean no they used to be that way all the time oh yeah i mean i I still i think i've got one teacher that taught me in grade school is still living and they they were there for years so is there anything else that you want the um, listeners to know or what's coming up next now that the budget has been finalized? Well, we're kind of out of Madison for a while. I'm working on legislation that I want to do next after the budget. And, um, and um, it's Jer- dairy breakfasts are over. Howard and I are starting the fair circuit right now, which I would rather be doing what I'm doing right now. With for me personally than being Madison anyway. I know Howard's got to be up there more than I do, but so I, I'm I'm catching up in, in district and going to places and, and visiting businesses and you know like I said the fairs we had a really good time on Saturday and I bought a lamb he bought a hog and so we had a good day. <laughs> well, I also saw a picture of Howard that he was uh, you know working in one of the food booths yeah. and so getting yeah. out there and rubbing elbows with the constituents yep, and yep so and um i thought i mentioned that, you know, last week um i had uh two county fairs suck in in lafayette and then this week is green county so i'll be heading down there um later this week also tomorrow uh starts uh, uh farm technology days which is in sock county uh, this year so i'll be heading up there i'll be volunteering uh for, for that um, and I have no idea what the attendance is going to be, but it, it's a huge event. And there'll be farmers there from, from I'm guessing, all over the, the Midwest coming to, to Sauk County. So I'm, I'm looking forward uh, to that. And, uh, you know, like today, and I just uh, follow up on what Todd said. I mean, now I just got a lot of stuff going on. I'll be out at County Highway O here uh, in, in a little bit here. I've got... Uh, uh, lunch with the uh, the sheriff, catch up with him, see how things are going. Tour um, Ellen Bradley uh, at at twelve thirty. Um, I'm getting a meeting with the Department of Transportation to get a tour of the uh, new bridge in um, uh, Lone Rock. You can get an update on, on the progress there. Uh, I've got a. I'm on the Wisconsin State Fair Park Board now. I've got a, a State Fair, uh, Fair Park Board meeting um, this evening and. Um, you know, just a lot more activity in, in district, um, which is wonderful. I mean, there's we've got there's just so many things going on, and uh, I, I visited with uh, some Farm Bureau members. Their uh, annual Farm Bureau annual meetings are coming up. I think starting next month, we got Towns Unit meetings uh, coming up here. Uh, so just an awful lot of meetings in, in district, which is uh, which, which that's the best part of my job. Have you been going to any parades? Um, not too many. Um, I, I was so during the, the early part of the parade season, um, I was during the budget and I had probably, um, six inches, six to eight inches of budget papers to read every weekend, uh, to get ready for the next, the votes, the next, the, the following week. So my weekends were, were pretty well were, uh, booked, uh, with that. So, um, I've got a bunch now on, on the schedule for the remainder of the, of the, of the summer. All right. Todd, do you have anything else to add? No. Um, like I said, I, I'm looking forward to the break and um, not break, but just being in district with people. That's, as you can tell by both of our schedules, that's what we enjoy doing. And uh, um, so, um, but it, it's going to go fast because I think we go back. Well, I got to go up next week for a couple things, but uh, we'll be back in for too long. So um, it's amazing. Election years, election cycles go so slow, but when you're actually in session it goes so fast so uh yeah it won't be too long and we've got another six seven months left and that'll be it time for elections again seems like it's a never-ending circle isn't it, it really is actually so but it's 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 nice i've been in this will be my fifth term and howard had this my assembly in what second term in senate so it's a third term in senate um we uh 
it's nice to be able to, you know, people come up to you and it's, you're approachable. They know you and they like talking about whatever. And, and I, I, that's the part I, I enjoy. It's just like Saturday at the fair. I mean, just stood there and people were coming up, you know, talking. And of course, rain was a big topic on Saturday, but uh, it, that's the stuff I enjoy. Yeah, I went to a program last week and they did a survey and they were asking, you know, do you get to talk to legislators? Do you, I'm like, I talk to mine all the time. <laughs> but, but I think it is hard for some people to really get to know their legislators. And I think it's programs like this that help. It does, you know. I mean, it takes me an hour to go to Walmart <laughs> just to pick up a couple of things. And I like to be that. I want people to approach us. So it's Howard. And uh, I like that. All right. It's also nice uh, for uh, talking about being approachable. You know, we get a chance to visit with a lot of um, school groups that tour the Capitol. And these are fourth graders, fifth graders generally. And it's so fun to connect with them and then to see them three months later at the fair or yeah. three months later, you know, and it's just, and, um, and I'll never forget um, the, uh, this was a, in, in Belmont. Uh, I had lunch with the Belmont district, school district administrator, and uh, at lunch, we're sitting in the cafeteria, and all these kids would come up and go, hello, Mr. Markline, hello, Mr. whatever. And he's like, how do you know all these kids? And I said, well, they were up at the Capitol, and then I was at the fair, and they were exhibiting at the, at the Lafayette County Fair. And then um, they did a tour of the first Capitol um, historic site, and they invited me to come along. So I spent that day with them. So, you know, I spent a fair amount of time w- with, the, with the kids, and it was, it was just wonderful, you know, to... to um, you know, have that time with the kids and uh, have a relationship with them. I remember several years ago when I opened up my mailbox and there was an envelope and the return address was Senator Howard Markline. I'm like, why is he writing me? And I open it up and it was a newspaper article with my daughter's picture in it. And I'm like, yeah. wow. We get, we get, um, we all, I think all legislators do that. He's he's got. We're very fortunate out here. I've, I think I've got eight newspapers in my assembly district. People, I get that all the time. Thank you for the note. And um, and how usually we write into the same people depends on where the district is. But people really like that. And um, I've had kids. Mothers tell me, you sent my son when he was in high school, he won't let me take it off the refrigerator. And it's like, to me, I'm just like Todd. So, but I guess, you know, that means a lot to, to, to people and wedding anniversaries, which, you know, so. Well, it, it makes you more approachable. And that's why I'm a firm believer. If you do have an issue, if you have a problem, contact your local legislators. Yeah. That's what you, it's what they're elected for. And I think some people, when they contact us, I'll call, I call them back and they kind of shocked to actually hear from the actual legislator. I think they're, they're a lot of people think they're going to deal with our staff and stuff, but if it's something that I can deal with, I'll call them myself. Right. And even, uh, you know, I got a call last week from a constituent in Avoca and, um, uh, it, it, they knew of somebody who had an issue, a passport issue. They wanted to travel for a family wedding and, uh, a passport had expired. Now I've got nothing to do with passports. Okay. But I know who can help. And so uh, we, you know, we made a couple phone calls, and we got the issue resolved, and, and you know, got their their passport uh, taken care of. So again, even on stuff that, you know, I'm we our, my office may not be able to help um, directly. Often we know who who the right person is to contact to to give them some assistance. And I'll just add too that a lot of the bills that I've passed and Howard and I have passed together, I would say probably half of them have come from constituent contacts issues in district and um i i I, that's uh, i enjoy doing and that's true um i wouldn't know about the idea if a constituent didn't call me or a municipal leader and did you know this and we've done quite a few bills and you have with tony and travis Tranel too and that's that's part of the job all right well i thank you very much and we'll see you next month